Komið þið sæjar, uh, velkomin á þetta annað erindi í hátegis fyrirlestar á röð fyrirlestarfæðinga og námsbrauta í hátegisfæðinu í Morgul Íslands og Þannig Samsvín. Uh, uh, á þeim verði kefin að, þá mungar við bara benda á að, að hér hefur við settur megnað bakkrá og því getur við kynnt ykkur hana á heimasíðu fyrirlands hátegisfæðinga og hér er uh, hlutli af henni, það eru sérst fyrirlestar að skipla þeim núna nokkuð með einu hverju einu sér ykkur fram á, fram á vor og, uh, og allir fjalla um rannsóknir sem eru í gangi eða, eða ný af, af stafna og sína að þetta hvað ljóskar er mikil í þessu, þessu fæði hjá okkur en í dag ætlar uh, Kevin Martin að segja okkur frá sínum rannsóknum á uh, einungunar vestbunninni hann er dóttarsmenni um bortaðarfæði við Hóskóli Íslands og er dóttarsverkefni hans er, er hluti af, af uh, umfáksmiklu rannsunarverkefni sem Kafi Lúkas stýrir en ég ætla ekki hafa fleiri orð um það Kevin, take it away Good morning, uh, afternoon, everybody hear me, all right? This is going to be in uh, Irish English uh, so I hope you can understand uh, we'll just start her here uh, Okay, so uh, this period is actually quite, uh, just one check, already, uh, how many minutes? 30. 30. Okay, just start the clock. Uh, yeah, uh, as I was saying, this is a, a kind of a new enough period to myself. Uh, my previous work and uh, research is in the Viking Age, like most people in Iceland. Uh, I guess, so uh, I kind of saw it as an interesting opportunity to combine a few of my different passions into one uh, yeah, project that hadn't really had a lot of archaeological research in the, in the past. So, uh, it, those of you who don't know who I am, uh, this is just a little summary of my uh, activities for the last um, couple of decades. I've uh, been working in Iceland uh, off and on since 2001, um, some of the sites there. Um, and uh, I guess uh, 2003 and 4 was an interesting time because I worked with the the Minjastofn and Neyðishafondavastræði department, so the underwater archaeological department of Ireland. We have our own specific unit for that, and um, that kind of was a catalyst for me to kind of uh, get into maritime archaeology and um, and look at issues in in, in that uh, respect. So I went down the road of learning to dive and. Um, became a commercial diver and uh, just to get access to the material and um, I uh, yeah I worked in a few different projects off and on in the meantime came to Iceland and uh, decided that this was maybe something interesting to look at here issues related to that field so um, a few projects I've done here uh, with the shipwreck Phoenix shipwreck I've done a, a survey in Thingvetler along the lake shore actually and um, you know it gave me enough of a catalyst and, and a push to kind of uh, try and do something uh, on a bigger scale and uh, chatting with Gavin and um, uh, whatnot we basically came up with this uh, plan to make it quite a bigger scale project looking at this period but with specific things I was interested in uh, researching um, so this is basically uh, more an introduction to the, the project for those that don't really know about it. Um, just, uh, I'll just run through this real quick. Uh, the project team members here, uh, Jakob, whom I met in the corridor this morning. Um, uh, so we're looking at two different things really and I'm just going to talk about my uh, side of it today. He can speak for himself I'm sure. Uh, it's a three year project um, and it's basically the premise is to understand archaeologically the trade monopoly period in Iceland. Period, period which historically is, is you know, pretty well researched uh, as far as I, I can see so far um, but w obviously with certain biases in the, in the narrative which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the analysis of this period archaeologically from my angle we'll, we'll look at it um, through the trade sites themselves, the archaeology of trade, at the trade uh, sites that the Danes used and also look at um, a shipwreck from the period uh, which uh, currently is the oldest known uh, shipwreck in Icelandic waters. Um, uh, we're also hopefully going to look at the um, 
hand over from the Hansa, the German trading, to the Danish uh, trading period. That's a very interesting time. And uh, there is another uh, large project, uh, larger than this one, being run by Natasha Meller. I'll talk about it a little bit, because there are uh, a lot of angles where both of our interests meet. Um, so, just a, a brief overview of the, of the monopoly here, uh, for those that uh, only remember from your school days. Um, the period we're looking at specifically is uh, 1602-1787, that's the 186 year uh, <laughs> period where the Danes more or less controlled or tried to control trade between Iceland and the outside world. Uh, there is obviously a, a run into that which uh, is of interest and there's obviously a, after 1787 we don't just start and stop on those two dates but they're pretty much the main times we're looking at. Um, uh, Iceland was divided into uh, a number of trade districts uh, during this period where each port was <coughs> port or trade site was responsible for um, looking after the trade within that. And if you lived in a certain place, you had, you had to, under the law, trade at a certain site. Um, <coughs> there was various punishments issued uh, for going against that. There was illegal trade going on um, and these types of things. Um, no, it's, okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little overview of the historical narrative that's previously been done. So here we have a, a map showing the, uh, the the Danish trade sites and the uh, the German trading sites. So you can just see the uh, the overlap uh, on both of those times. Uh, it's not always exactly in the same place, that's one thing to be aware of. There are a few sites where, uh, for instance, in Buda, where the site was moved during the Danish period. But more or less, uh, you're looking at um, activity on, or in and around the same places. Uh, so, um, the Danish trade monopoly has up until recently been regarded as a particularly dark period of Iceland's history. Both uh, Jan Adels, Knut Gerser, writing in the early 20th century, certainly paint a grim and uninspiring view of the 1780th century period in Iceland. Prior to discussing the monopoly trade, which Gerset describes as the most grievous cause, plunging the Icelandic people into such disheartening economic and social conditions as they had yet suffered, he has the good sense to lead us into that particular dark chapter with an outline of the homes of the Icelandic peasants and what particular ailments and diseases they suffered from <laughs> as a result of the unhealthy lives and homes they inhabited. He talks of the peasants' cheerless hovel without even the most basic of comforts, built not of wood, as the merchants brought little timber to trade because it took too much room in their ships, but built of stone and sod, the lack of windows only adding to the cheerless atmosphere, which uh, the effect that the occupants sat in continual darkness, even in the middle of the day. Um, as if that wasn't bad enough, even the most basic human comforts of breathing while sitting in total darkness was continuously interrupted from the clouds of pipe tobacco smoke billowing out from the men's mouths all day long, which according to Jon Jonsson came as a result of the Danish merchants, making them believe that by smoking more, they would protect themselves from the very diseases such as tuberculosis, which the damp smoke-filled houses cause. Gerset advocates that the spirit of the Icelandic population, having been so whittled down to a position of obedience and economic dependence, fostered an unprogressive and apathetic spirit to social development which then set up nicely the Danish aims of controlling the trade with Iceland. Throughout this chapter on the monopoly trade, Gerset makes reference to the lack of arrival of goods, in particular wheat and flour, or the arrival of items not fit for consumption, all contributing to the wearing down, submission, and occasional starvation of the native population. I'm reminded of the remarks from the 19th century Irish revolutionary John Mitchell, who said of the Irish potato famine, um, in the, in the mid-19th century, God sent the potato blight, but the English sent the famine, um, implying that there was food in the country, there could have been brought food to the country, but it was a decision not to do that. While the scales are different, the relative scales are similar, and the combination of natural disasters, disease, high infant mortality in Iceland during this period, did not make life exactly prosperous for the average peasant farmer to begin with. So that's just kind of planted an image of uh, this period in your head. And uh, the writings at the time, the early 19th century, or in the early 20th century, are littered with this type of uh, stuff. 
the seeds of monopoly co control in Iceland were, according to Gisli Gunnarsson, effectively sown during the mid to late 15th century, when the Danish attempted to control the English access to the waters around the Danish Sound by seizing a number of English ships in Orosund. Uh, there followed more effective control of the English activities by the Crown after the Reformation in Iceland in the mid-16th century, when Danish troops were stationed almost permanently in the country from 1538 to 1555. Perhaps as a precursor to monopoly trade organization, the Danish Crown started selling licenses to foreign merchants, mostly German, in 1562. As Gunnar Carlsen notes, it seemed as if German merchants, mainly hamburgers, uh, the royal administration and the Icelandic e elite all joined forces in expelling the English from the country. Uh, four years earlier, in 1558, the Danes had confiscated all the property of the English uh, at the Westman Islands. However, with the completion of the Skansen Fort there in 1586, um, this signaled more or less the beginnings of a changing of the guard scenario in terms of foreign trade in Iceland. Uh, the effectiveness of this fort and the amount of troops stationed there, however, remains quite questionable given the arrival and ransacking of the island by Algerian pirates in 1627, who kidnapped 234 Icelanders, uh, killed 34 of them, including one of the church ministers. That's, those same pirates uh, anecdotally arrived in my uh, home in Cork um, four years later and uh, made off with another 200 people down to Algeria. Uh, for the next 20 years or so, Danish administration set about trying to get the trade out of the hands of the Germans. So basically they had, uh, you know, got the English out through the help of the Germans. Now they want to try to get the Germans out. And um, while still curring the support of the Icelandic elites. So uh, it's interesting, I mean, Refn Robestorter talks about you, you don't see Iceland as a separate state from Denmark at the time. This is just from the Danish side's internal policy. So you, you should kind of think about it like that rather than one state against another, if you know what I mean. Uh, from around 1600, the image of an ambitious king is presented, in this case Christian IV, aiming to secure the rewards and gains of a monopoly trade within the Danish realm, inspired in a large part by the mercantilism and general monopoly trade structures employed by his Euro European contemporaries. So you think of the Dutch East in West Indian Company, the Hudson Bay Company, these types of things. Um, from 1620 to 1662, the Iceland Faro and Northland Company was set up and active in Copenhagen and became one of the most important trade companies in the city during this period, but it was dissolved uh, following the Danish-Swedish War. When on the 20th of April, 1602, Christian IV decreed the trade of Iceland was restricted to the merchants from Copenhagen, Ellisnor and Malmo, there wasn't exactly an immediate pullout of Iceland by the German merchants. Trade harbour shops didn't change directly from Wurst to Pilsa on that date, but the handover took a longer time. We see in 1608 another, another decree from the Danish crown to pull down the former houses of the German merchants at the trade sites in Iceland, showing us that there were still remnants of the previous German trade existing. How much or little of this 1608 decree was enforced on the ground may perhaps be possible to see and test archaeologically during this project, uh, which is We'll talk about a little further. Uh, time. Okay, I need to speed up here. In the last 20 years, historians, including Robert Stoddard and Carlson, have started to revise the dark and gloomy view um, to see it less of a, a colonial struggle of the Icelandic peasants against the ambitious Danish crown and more of a system which catered, in a sense, to the Icelandic elite, while at the same time preserving the existing rural setup within Iceland. As Carlson notes, by being obliged regularly to supply every trading harbour, even the least profitable, so you see, like. Uh, so density of population was all along the west coast and also density of the, the fishing resources is, is confined to there. But, you know, you have sites over in, uh, in Reyðarfjörður, Vopnafjörður. These areas may never have got a trade site without the, the trade monopoly. So uh, <laughs> that certain harbours would never have been used for trade in a free trading situation is without doubt. It worked as a levelling force, equaling out price fluctuations, helped smaller poor districts get minimal trade, attempt to favour farming over the more profitable fishing. Uh, perhaps possible the system developed as an alliance between the Crown, Copenhagen merchants and the Icelandic aristocracy, which were the better off farmers. So that's a summary, uh, a bit, little bit too long and dense, of the history at the time uh, and the history behind this period. Uh, I'm going to fly through this. Uh, this is basically a summary of 
what this project is about, which is what I should be talking about, but uh, it's hard to do that without giving you an intro into it. So, um, this element of the project concerns itself with examining the mechanics of trade sites themselves, the logistics of trade, the layout and workings of the trade sites. We must imagine that for a particular time of year, mainly in the summer, as the merchants were forbidden from overwintering until 1777, these trade stations were a bustling environment to which both fish, livestock and other products, including bob wools, socks, were brought to trade for imported goods, including timber, iron, flour, grain, tobacco, beer, wine, spirits, salt, hemp, uh, sail plots, ropes, clay pipes, and Dutch delftware pottery, among, amongst others. What imprint would this trade activity have left in the archaeological record uh, at these locations? There would have been storage houses for the goods being traded, accommodation for the merchants and their entourage, other buildings to house goods and foodstuffs which they would consume themselves uh, during the trade season. Perhaps even a building for boat repair would have been constructed. Refuse related to the food consumed by the merchants might have been left in the form of midden dumps. Broken cargo beyond repair, including pottery, etc., may have been dumped on, uh, in and around the sites. Animals and livestock would have needed to have been enclosed and fed. Horses brought by the locals would have needed to have been looked after. As noted by the nobleman, Una van Troel, uh, who accompanied Joseph Banks in his trip to Iceland in 72, 1772, when the Icelanders travel to seaports to exchange their fish and other goods, they have 20 30 or sometimes a greater number of horses with them, uh, which carry a load of three or 400 pounds each. He also notes that they never carry any food uh, for their horses, as pasture is plenty everywhere, even at the expense of the local landowner at the trade harbour site. People who uh, were themselves trading with the merchants would also have been camping there for an unspecified period. They themselves would surely leave an impact in terms of cultural material in the archaeological record. How great an impact they left is open for debate. Um, at some of the busier trade harbours, it may have taken the form of setting up temporary structures or booths. Uh, we know from Jan Adels that the locals taking advantage of the resources at the trade harbours was often a source of complaint by the farmers and landowners to the local seasonal and that activities associated with the trading damaged their lands and used up a lot of their grazing grounds. Perhaps the people trading would arrive too early for the merchants' boats. Adels notes a complaint at Ederbaki of a ship which took six weeks to come to anchor in the harbour, from just outside the harbour. What I'm getting at here is that this trade is not exact, an exact science, and the weather, as we all know in Iceland, is not predictable to an exact degree, particularly uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. You didn't just SMS your customers or put up a Facebook status saying, uh, to those living in the Bausander Koipsede trade district, due to unforeseen circumstances, we will not be sailing our boat to Bausander this year, but instead, we'll put in a Grindavik. Our apologies, the Danes. Delays of weeks rather than days were the norm, I would suspect. Uh, even worse was when the trade boat wouldn't even show up, as happened often at the shared harbours, where one harbour would have been favoured over another in a particular year, or because a particular produce was more plentiful and more profitable. Um, so if we go back to the harbours a second, uh, I just... Uh, I'm not sure if you caught that. A lot of these harbours were divided into livestock or, or fish, so slaughter or or fish harbours. Some were both, but uh, the division was, was either or. Uh, the fish was more profitable for the merchants, um, and the locals, of course, wanted to get rid of their livestock uh, as much as, as possible. So for a preliminary assessment of the monopoly trade sites around Iceland, oh, so far a preliminary assessment of the monopoly trade sites around Iceland has, has revealed that for the vast majority there is little surviving archaeological evidence on the ground in the form of ruins or other remnants of the trading activity. Uh, this is to a large degree due to the modernization of Iceland, particularly from the mid-20th century uh, onwards. Uh, yeah, okay, we're coming on to this. Um, and the redevelopment of the harbour. So basically, uh, a lot of these sites have been pulled down in the mid-20th century uh, with no real uh, consideration for the, the archaeological importance of them. Many of the trade houses and buildings were either pulled down or reused uh, during this period. Could be argued that some of these trade sites were the precursor for many of the modern towns in Iceland, which sit today in the same locations uh, that the trade sites once stood and used the same harbours. So we start with a figure of 27 uh, harbour sites, uh, which had monopoly trade activity at some point during this period. Uh, and by a process of elimination, that number dwindles down to single digits, which have potential for further, digit, uh, further research within the scope of this project. Currently, a number of contenders for further research uh, focus uh, are in focus. These include uh, Bausender, which is, uh, which is out here, um, 
Grundafjörður, uh, Kumbarvogur and Búður. Uh, while the majority of the sites in the southwest and west of Iceland have had an on-site archaeological inspection already either by myself or others, uh, there are a number of other sites in the west fjords and eastern fjords which require uh, the same uh, examination before a final plan of action uh, for the fieldwork can be made. Uh, in addition to land survey and some test excavations, Take the time. Okay. Uh, we would like to conduct an under, uh, we, I would like to conduct an underwater archaeological survey at a specific number of sites connected with the trade. These surveys may be very valuable in identifying ships, uh, anchorages, and landing sites previously unknown uh, submerged archaeological remains connected with the trade. Could include wrecked ships, partner ships, ballast stone, ships tire anchoring points, artifacts lost or dumped during the activity of trade at the harbour. Particularly the harbour sites, which no longer have any surviving archaeological, uh, archaeological remains on land, uh, the only remains associated with those may be underwater. So, these submerged features, if existing, deserve to be registered, protected from future development within the harbour area. So, uh, I'll have to come back a little bit. So, what did these sites actually look like? Um, was there a generic, almost franchise trade harbour setup? Uh, which each of the merchants arranged once they rented the harbour. Um, we have seen an overlap of locations with German and, and Danish harbours. Of the 31 harbours uh, shown on the map, uh, the Danes had activity at 27 of them. Uh, and of those 27, the Germans had activity in 24. So, of the 27 Danish harbours, uh, 24 of them were used by Germans previously, uh, either in the exact same location or slightly ne uh, or nearby. Uh, ultimately, the fishing grounds of population density clusters um, drew them to back, always back to the same spot. Did the Danes just take over the existing German booths and shops, refit and remodel them, or were they, as instructed by the Royal Decree, tear them down and build their own? Can we see this in the archaeological remains? Did the, tra did the tra uh, trade sites change majorly between the 17th and 18th centuries? as the Danish grip on, on the monopoly trade tightened. So this is one thing I saw, uh, I've kind of noticed in the, my readings so far. Uh, it seems to be a change between the 17th and 18th century uh, in terms of the, um, the control. <coughs> there's, there's less illegal trading in the 18th century. Uh, the Danes seem to have kind of got a better grip of it. Um, we see in cer some circumstances that a number of the sites are abandoned also. Uh, for instance, that reef is abandoned uh, and also uh, the Cumbar of Ogres abandoned in 1664. Uh, another part of this project we look at is what type of ships were used. Um, does the shipbuilding technology also change during the handover from German to Danish trade? Is this also connected with the amount of goods being brought in uh, to the country? More goods require bigger ships with larger cargo holds. Can we get a sense of the trade from the ships used and can we see this archaeologically? So one way of trying to investigate some of these questions specifically is return is a return to the uh, wreck at Flate. There is a video coming. You do not listen to have to listen to me uh, for another uh, ten minutes. Uh, I will come back to this later. Uh, what the, what was the scale of illegal trade during this period? Is this something we can test archaeologically? That's going to be a very difficult one. This is probably an element more suited to Jakob's project uh, rather than mine. But you know there is an overlap to some degree. I'm interested in what he what he's looking at. I, think, I hope he's interested in what I'm talking about. Although this project is focusing on the Danish monopoly trade, we need to be aware that we are also operating, uh, the Danes were also operating the monopoly trade in the Faroe Islands and Greenland at the same time. Uh, comparing the operation of the monopoly in both jurisdictions is not without its merits. Given the incredibly unlikely event of surplus funding from the Icelandic fieldwork element in this project, uh, <laughs> there may be potential to archaeologically investigate the monopoly in the Faroe Islands for comparative evidence to the Icelandic sites. And I just have to be continued in bold. Um, the role of the Icelandic merchants. Uh, this is also harder to show archaeologically than some of the earlier questions. But an important aspect of this period. Does this role change through the period? How can we measure that? Uh, can we do it by the size and development of the trade sites? Uh, by the license fees that were paid? So the, the, fle the fees fluctuated given the, uh, um, the different nature uh, of the trade. Um, how close a role did they play in the trade itself? Was it, hand, was it hands on? So were they literally at the, at the site throwing the stuff out? Or were they back in Denmark, uh, you know, uh, waiting for the reports of, of the particular, particular trade season? Just because a particular merchant secured the trade license, sent the boat, and rented the boat, doesn't mean they were on board. Uh, 
and getting their hands dirty. Um, yeah, finally, uh, an in-depth review uh, of the, uh, let's see here, yeah, this is a good one. In-depth review of the primary and secondary historical source from Iceland, Denmark and Holland, which document activity at the trade sites in Iceland. So there is primary sources in, in Holland and Denmark which haven't been seen before. This is one I got a loan of from uh, Retina Roberts' daughter who discovered this recently. This is a map of the uh, plan of the trade site in Patrickstuder, showing the layout of the site. If I was to look at that and not know it was Patrick Schuder, I would just see a layout of town. I would see a layout of streets and here you have the, uh, the merchant's house here. Uh, it's in uh, Danish and some other cities, but uh, uh, these locations show the specific locations in the house where the merchant uh, sat, where the people, the customers sat, where the goods were stored. So incredible uh, levels of detail are emerging uh, in these archives. Um, so I think, you know, the, she's uncovered the, a, a number of previously unseen charts and maps, some of which document the trade sites in an uh, extremely detailed level. Uh, presumably, so the authorities could get an accurate valuation of the harbour that they were leasing out. So they wanted to know what they had uh, in order to be able to uh, build for it. Um, I'm getting screwed for time now here. Uh, the previous archaeological research, so what's been done to date? Uh, what am I actually looking at here? Uh, there's not a lot. I was going to put up a slide like some people do of a black screen. There is a little bit more than that. Archaeologically, only a very limited amount of work has been carried out. Uh, very few of the sites have actually been archaeologically surveyed. Bausender, uh, Thingari, Eirabaki by Margaret uh, Halman's daughter, Holmer, Annalisa Goodman's daughter, Grundefjörder, Goodman Rolofsson and Magda Sigurdsson have done some work there. Uh, Natasha Meller's project, which she talked last month, is looking at Kumbar of Older. I'm not going to dwell on that one. Um, in terms of previous archaeological excavations, the list is smaller. Uh, the FSI, the Archaeological Institute, did a project in uh, uh, Kuvikur, um, and that's located uh, up here in Reykjavik. It's an old shark oil station. And um, 2004, they dug it, dug a midden there. Uh, results basically revealed uh, mainly finds from the 1920th century, some 18th century material, but nothing suggesting there was masses of it or anything like that. Um, the only other, and now you can see, X marks the, uh, the trenches here of the site. This house on the right is the old trading house. Uh, the meeting was dug just to the right of that. Uh, this is uh, the only other uh, archaeological project I've uh, come across so far in, into the site from this period. This is um, a painting of the Yarkery Trade Harbour site uh, from the 19th century, and on the right is a piece of uh, porcelain. Uh, this was dug by Armand Goodmanson, 2014 and 15. Uh, he has a plan to go back this year, uh, mainly finds from 18th century upwards. So nothing concrete which shows us this is a house, this is the, the pack house, this is the storage room, but indications of, of those things. Um, okay, um, so these basically kind of uh, show you the development of some of the sites from uh, 17th century to today. So if we look here, uh, to break it, people might be more familiar, this is ground here. Um, there's a, uh, that's all been infilled now and the next map will kind of show you that. So here's the original island, or what I'm saying, the trade site was here, and all that's been infilled. There's a, a fish factory sitting on top of the trade site now. Um, so these are what the sites, you know, we're interpreting the sites that have looked like. This is a Vopnefjörder, this is a, a painting of Vopnefjörder from, from 1800. Uh, here's the map of Patrick's field there, Skagastron. So there are quite substantial sites. You can see all the buildings here. Now, this is all obviously in the 19th century, so maybe it expanded then, but we can project a little bit back. Um, Grundefjörder, this is an interesting site uh, from our perspective. Uh, it's probably one of the best preserved trade sites left in Iceland, actually. Uh, it's free to list, which makes it complicated, uh, but you know, uh, we'll cross our fingers. Um, so this is a painting of Grundefjörder, here's Grundefjörder here, the town was moved, the uh, town is here now, so this is Grundefjörder Camper, this is the trade site. Um, here's a Google map, uh, shot of it here, you can see the buildings here. Uh, this was actually one of, the, one of the first planned towns of Iceland, you can see an interpretive um, map here, archaeological interpretation, you have a hatmaker's house here, and um, the crambles, the shop here, and the uh, uh, a path into the, into the center of the town uh, or the, the village. Um, here's, a, here's the view of the site today. 
You can see there are mains, there's a wall, here's another wall, here's another wall, here's another wall. Um, so this is actually one of, the, of all the sites I've visited, this is the clearest archaeological remains. Uh, and it's, you know, screams uh, excavation. Um, here we have Bausender. This is just showing you some of the maps I've been looking at and, and finding. This is the Danish navigational chart. Uh, I'm stressing time now. Here's the boat. These are tying, oh, here's the boat. These are the tying points. Uh, showing, the, showing you where to tie up the boat. We go to Bausender today at low tide. You have one of these tying points here. Um, there are several here that are uh, not seen at low tide, so we may uh, dive the site to, to find the locations of those. There is a typology for these as well, so we may be of the day. This is ballast stone from Kumbarvogel um, in Snifelsnes, from uh, yeah, this side here, Kumbarvogel. So that ballast stone was found by the local farmer in. Um, uh, yeah, in Kumar Hooger, and uh, this is not native stone to Iceland. So this was taken in by one of the ships, whether one of the German or, or Danish, who both used the site, we're not sure. But this is the type of thing that I would hope to find in the underwater surveys. Finally, onto the interesting stuff: uh, the location of the uh, milk made, made ship, uh, the milk made, I suppose you would say in English. So the um, so here we are. Uh, this is a small part of the project. I have to stress, but it's an important part. Flatley Island here, anybody's never been, should take a trip. Um, very nice place to, uh, to do some work when the weather is nice. Uh, we move on. I've marked, X marks the spot. This is the location of the wreck site. This is an old uh, volcanic, uh, volcano, an old crater uh, in the sea. And um, the ship uh, sank at anchor in. Uh, oh, okay. There's my two minutes uh, warning. Okay. Ship sank an anchor in the sea, or uh, while, while in the harbour in 1658. Uh, took two days to sink, 15 sailors on board, uh, 14 managed to get off, overwintered on the island, the annals are telling us this. Uh, built a ship out of the remains of that ship and sailed it back to Holland. Um, so, whether we believe that or not. This is a really crude drawing, so excuse me, uh, it's a crude annotation I should say. This is. Uh, Drawing is true by my annotations. This is basically uh, an original uh, sketch by the Innocence project in 1993. So here's the part of the uh, ship that he investigated. Um, we went back in 2015 uh, in May to uh, basically do a reconnaissance to just see what was left there. Is there anything left there? Was there was there anything to to uh, to explore. So in early May, myself, uh, myself along with Magnus Sigurdsson, uh, Mindy Verne for Westerlands, and Fraser Cameron, I see him out there somewhere, uh, a diving colleague from Hospital Eastlands, we spent three days in the freezing waters of Breidafjord. Uh, the water temperature at the trip was approximately four degrees Celsius on the surface. So when you go down, it gets colder. As depth increased, so uh, to the temperature. Uh, the purpose of the dive was an inspection of the milkmaid uh, in Flatte uh, to assess the remains of the wreck itself, current state of preservation, and whether it was feasible to have a larger survey project at the wreck site. We also wanted to test the logistics of running such a project in such a remote location, uh, check the in-water conditions and assess what would be required in terms of time um, and equipment for running a bigger project later on. In the meantime, I managed to get the Dutch uh, Minjestofnen for underwater archaeology involved, experts in 17th century shipwrecks, which uh, I'm not, and uh, they've agreed to be part of this project and to specifically come with expertise and dive on this ship so we can actually kind of uh, see what we're dealing with here because it wasn't clear from the original survey. Um, okay, this is, a, this is what the ship I think would have looked like, a, a Dutch flute style ship. And uh, this is something we're hoping to test uh, when we go back. Certain construction elements may survive. Uh, you're just looking at the lower deck. So all we have in the flat is kind of this part. And certain elements may survive, which tell us what type of ship we're dealing with. Um, so hopefully we're, we're going to be able to, to, uh, to find those things out. Uh, the old tim what we found during our dive is the old timbers were solid, they weren't brittle. Um, the evidence of the shipworm, Terrader Novalis, was observed uh, in many of them. We recognized and located the previous survey area uh, of, of the Japanese uh, project from 93. Uh, by, the, by the way, his original trench lines were, were still down there. Uh, in all, we had three dives in the wreck over the three days. Tidal range of flat is up to six meters, so you have to uh, basically dive at a high tide, which we didn't realize uh, 
would be a problem, but when we arrived and the boat was six meters down and we're trying to load 50 kilo dive equipment on, uh, it's a problem. Uh, let me see. <laughs> There's not a lot of evidence of artifacts and material left on the wreck. So we didn't find stacks of pottery, all the rest of it. You can see, it's, I've summarized it here. Um, um, what he found, uh, 35 kilos of pottery, 400 artifacts. I went through the artifacts in the National Museum and uh, here are some pictures of them here. Uh, beautiful Delftware plates. It still represents the, the biggest find of Dutch pottery from this period in Iceland. Um, so, uh, one on the right isn't from the wreck, that's just a complete example, okay. And um, that's the type of stuff you're dealing with. Here's from the wreck, these are completed uh, roadblocks. So you have, you know, very nice material um, which I'm hoping um, the uh, Reykjavik uh, museums might uh, exhibit as part of this project. That's something that's kind of happening at the moment, talking to them about that. You actually have two wrecks. You have two for the price of one in flat. You have a, a 19th century wreck sitting on top of the, the earlier uh, 17th century wreck. So we actually can look at issues of preservation through time underwater in Iceland, uh, which is unique, I think. Uh, uh, here's a cannon, a uh, sketch of a cannon at least, uh, no longer, uh, I think it's no longer with us, so I've been looking for it in the museum. Uh, if anybody knows about other cannons from this period, let me know. We have a, a mention of one in uh, Grindafjörður, there's one potentially out in Bowson or the farmer has somewhere. So if you know about these types of things, I'd be very interested to hear, uh, you know. Um, return to the milkmaid, okay, I've gone through why we're going back. We, we, we want to see. I don't get the impression there's cargo left on it. I don't get the impression it was sailing out, actually, when it sank, full of fish. So we're not going to find a lot of cargo. But um, I think what we will be able to find is the uh, construction of the ship, uh, try and get an idea about that. The, the role of the merchant, Jonas Trelland, the guy that actually rented the ship, um, it was a Dutch ship rented by a Dane. Even though the Dutch weren't allowed to be in Iceland, the sailors were Dutch. A year after the ship sank, uh, there's a court case in Amsterdam, insurance claim for what went down on the wreck. The Icelandic Annals say it's 60,000 fish, the uh, insurance claims said 70,000 fish. So we have a little bit of doctoring of the figures. A year after that, the, the Dutch arrived, recovered uh, 13 of the 14 cannons on board. Probably the, the first uh, underwater uh, uh, scuba dive in Iceland's history as well. Yeah. So you have all these interesting things happening. Um, what I would like to do is, with the new techniques we have available to us, especially 3D photogrammetry, is test that on this wreck wasn't available in 93 when they did their project, but uh, we're hoping to do it this time. Uh, finally, and this is the la one of the last things, is the, uh, a video of the project, a uh, little uh, three minute video here. So I'll shut up now, one second. Quick time not available. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I wonder, can I get it going some other way? Ah, that's, that's not good. This was going to save me. Um, okay, uh, I don't think I'm going to try. Can I, do I have time to try and get this going? Sure. Or, okay, two seconds. Uh, talk amongst yourselves, please. <laughs> okay, I've taken an adapter with me. It's worth seeing because it's probably the only video of the shipwreck in existence. So I think it's nice to see it. Uh, 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 This better work. Okay. Okay. This is in sticky summer. It looks warm, but it was freezing. As most days are in Iceland, so. I don't know where the feedback is coming from, so you'll have to put up with them. Uh, here we are, so when we do this program, we have to take a boat on a boat. 
It's a bit ridiculous. We have to take our own boat to the island. Uh, it looks like the, the, there's the harbour where the ship is here. It looks like the side is closed. You can swim across to it, but you'd be washed away. Uh, here we are. Our taxi, island taxi. So this project was worth, was worth its way in gold uh, for logistics, uh, basically to get an idea of logistics for doing this project. Um, you can see the sea is quite flat. So the ship is here. Well, here we are. And this is a combination of a few different dives, but uh, you, you'll get an idea. We're not making it up, there is something there. In here. You can see the growth on the ship. And Bjarne talks about spending, you know, eight, eight of ten days clearing this uh, kelp. So that's a big issue. If we go back, we're going to have to go back uh, before the archaeological element. Here's timber. Here, this is oak. We'll have to go back before the archaeological element and, and actually clean it. This is about ten meters deep. Here's some coal. So this was used as a harbour, you know, since the medieval times here. So you're going to find all sorts of stuff. Uh, knock you around down there, it may not be related to the wreck. So here's a, what looks like a 19th century uh, bowl here. There is a 19th century wreck there as well, so I'm not surprised to find that in the uh, nearby. So here we have, you can see the timbers here lying this way. You can see them there, the, the crater is kind of coming down like that. There's no, there's no real silt on top, which I was quite surprised. I thought it would be, you know, meters of silt, but not at all. A quick wave with your hand and you start to see very quickly. Some of the timbers blackened. The, the annals talk about the ship burning and sinking. So, perhaps it's from that. Now, I might look, you know, that I'm uh, warm and snug, but it's actually it's freezing cold at that point there. Uh, different types of timber as well, so I think you have a mix, and this is common, you have a mix of oak and, and various other types of timber down there. Uh, the ship's worm is, is present here though, it, it, it does survive in Iceland, we can see that from it. So here's a, uh, this is this is a flint ballast uh, stone, and this is uh, again stone that's not uh, native in Iceland, so this was either brought in by the, uh, the Dutch ship, um, uh, coming in, dump the ballast, load up with cargo, sail out. Oh, yeah. Here's our uh, fourth member of our expedition here. Dinner. Here's the, uh, here's the crater. It's kind of lying along the crater, like a bowl. If you can see that. You can see the timbers coming across. That music wasn't playing in my head. This is uh, on the uh, video. We can see the timbers stacked up nicely there. Um, there is an indication from uh, Bjartman's work and from this dive that we have a mass step. And that actually gives us a uh, position on the ship. Uh, we're looking at something that's 25 meters long, approximately. Which fits with the idea that it is a Dutch flute uh, style ship. About 200 tons uh, cargo uh, hold on these things. You can see it starts to get silted really quickly though, even though there's not a lot of silt kicking and thrashing, you lose your visibility quick enough. So um, uh, this is why we choose to do this in the winter rather than in the summer. Visibility is better in, in winter time in Iceland in the water. You can start to see corrosion here, from, uh, either from shipworm or just, uh, I mean it's been in the water 350 or so years. So. Well, I think what struck me was the condition of the wood. Uh, it's solid. It's like a, you know, a deck you have out the back garden. It's, it's solid timber. So here we are finishing our dive. And uh, time is very important during this project. Time and water because we had 90 minutes of dive time over three days. So I'm just giving out about the cold. And uh, finally, acknowledgements. Uh, the various people that have helped us out. Uh, in particular, the, the Balder Ferry, who... Uh, who gave us the passage uh, complimentary as uh, on condition I mentioned them, so uh, that's that. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Bjarni and Magnus, Bjarni especially for giving me the original archive of the, uh, the ship uh, project, and uh, Magnus for his uh, help and constant help uh, 
visiting these sites and meeting the, the, the knowledgeable locals, which is actually very key to this project, is meeting the, the relevant people uh, who know about these places but maybe uh, uh, don't mention them so much or whatever. So that's, uh, yeah, you may go now. <laughs> Two seconds. I'm just going to kill this uh, feedback. How am I going to record? Yeah, we're just going to do a basic survey of it. I mean, this project, unfortunately, is not uh, entirely about the ship. I wish it was, but it's not. So uh, I can't really afford to spend uh, too much time on that aspect. But uh, we can basically do a lot with uh, photogrammetry. And uh, you know, with a basic GoPro swim over, we can actually map the site. Uh, quickly and get a very accurate uh, degree of recording from that. So much as archaeologists today use drones and cameras and take measurement points, uh, we'll do the same thing. I'm particularly interested in looking at uh, this part. Uh... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um... <laughs> Can I lift that one? Yeah, I have to connect it. Uh, there's a part of the ship which got me. Um, his. His investigation, they were so limited with time that it didn't. Uh, yeah, these two parts, we, we confirmed there's finger here and it's running in this direction. And um, so I think we go back, our plan is to basically clean the entire length of it and, and see actually the relationship as well between this wreck and, and the 19th century. But those are the cannons here, they're not cannons. Um, and just to understand a little bit the site formation there, like what's going on, what you're looking at, because it's not, it's not exactly clear. Uh, it's a unique wreck in a sense. When I told the, the Dutch authorities about it, and they'd known about it, but they didn't really know too much about it, but they were immediately skeptical of the name because less than 1% of shipwrecks have a name. So they told me, well, from this period, we have a dozen shipwrecks called Melting. How do you know it's this one? Blah, blah, blah. But we have it mentioned in uh, two different uh, annals, the, uh, the Dutch and also the Icelandic, which is unique. And the account in the Icelandic annals is very detailed, which leads me to think it was uh, somebody who was on the island told the, the chronicler about it, because it's level of detail I, I, you don't get from uh, gossip or whispers. So, yeah, any other tidbits? In the insurance claim, not do they mention the cargo? Yeah, they mentioned the, the cargo. Uh, uh, where are we here now? Um, yeah, here we go. 70,000 uh, salt. I've taken this on the Dutch record. Salted codfish, 28 tons of salted meat, so that's the slaughter element. 600 litres of whale oil, which I guess uh, didn't uh, help the, uh, the burning situation that, when that caught fire. Uh, one and a half tons of talcum, that's going to be hard to. To find archaeologically, we're not going to see that, I think. And then the sheepskins. What I, what I did see down there when we were down there during our dive is a lot of fish bones. And this is something that feeds back into Natasha's project a little bit, that uh, they're looking at fish bone analysis of the, what type of fish were traded, how big were they. And uh, one impression I got was that they were much bigger than the fish we think about a cod now or, or whatnot. The fish back then, the average size was much bigger. Like they're, they're talking about cods one and a half meters long or two meters long. So I wonder if we, if we take a sample of fish bones from the wreck, if we can see that, you know. Uh, and also a, a dendro sample is something the Dutch are very interested in taking for their own uh, database. We can actually tell where, where and when the ship was built. Typically it's 1,500 uh, trees to make a ship uh, like that, a forest of trees. Not an Icelandic forest, but... Uh... And there is fish bone. There is fish bone, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, it is a little bit, uh, yeah, I think uh, in that environment you're dealing with all sorts of stuff washing in though, but I'm confident that uh, the fish bone there is related to, the, to that wake, not, not something else. So. Um, but I did dive the harbour itself, like we used one of the dives where I dove all the way across here, about 80 metres or so. We were, originally we spent uh, that evening looking for the ship, um, and uh, so I used the opportunity just to see uh, was there a lot of material scattered in here or whatnot, and uh, how deep the silt was? So you plunge your hand down and see what you're gonna 
find and it's not it's not a um, i wouldn't say it's extremely silty in there it's a, it is a silty environment but it's not it's not meters deep it's it's like uh, up to your elbow and uh, i didn't get an impression that there was a uh, i found some powder over here some there but there, there's not like a you know a debris field from it so i think they basically salvaged the annals the icelandic annals say that they uh, they salvaged enough timber from it to build another ship I mean, on these ships, you did have carpenters, you had master shipbuilders. Um, so, I mean, that's not without, uh, uh, you know, that's not without its accuracy. But I think they probably, they may have built a ship to get to the mainland and then jumped on another ship back to, to Holland. I don't think they sailed a seagoing vessel back from Clampe. Um That's my impression of it. But, uh, but you know, we're, uh, a part of this project will test those records a little bit, but that's not the goal. My goal isn't to kind of read the annual, go and check, and that's not the, that's not the issue, to be honest. But uh, it's interesting to, while you're there to check these things and see if the, how accurate these things are, you know? Because, I mean, apart from talking constantly about the bad weather, the annals, you know, uh, uh, may be quite accurate in this regard, you know? They're certainly accurate about the weather. So, am I free? <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a sort of, I mean, obviously the, the, the circumstantial argument that uh, this is, is this is the same shape that uh, you have these records of is, is good. But uh, I mean, how, how would you how would you prove it? In, in and, and sort of, because that sounds like uh, at least a part of your objectives is is to know more about uh, what you have there uh, yeah. and, the, and, and to be to be more sure that it is the, the, the same one because a lot of the interpretation presumably rests on whether you can use the historical evidence uh, yeah uh, i mean i think it's i mean the, the original discoverers of the of the of the wreck pretty much followed the animals like that looked at the animal okay there is a, a ship sank in flatte on the old gamma in the old harbor in flatte let's go there and look and you go there and look and you find the ship and uh, they used it for that and, and the Dutch records refer to in west of Iceland they refer to this merchant and uh, he's mentioned in the Danish records as well as having ships in this area seven ships during this period so uh, you know uh, this is one of them and uh, I think it's you know I think it's fairly uh, I think it's fairly um, accepted that this is the wreck that's uh, that the pottery all, all the indications point to a mid 17th century Dutch uh, rig, but you know, I do like skepticism. I'm a cynic by nature, and uh, but, I mean, you know, we're not going to find a we're not going to find a, a plate or a nameplate with something on it. You know, no, uh, it's. I don't think it's critical for us either, though, to say conclusively it is this, because at the end of the day, we're dealing with a 17th century vessel of some kind that was plying its trade here, and for our project, it can be that general actually. Okay, so you don't mind actually? If it's no, no, it, it, it would be to, to be able to accurately tell a story and, and, and whatnot and dot the eye across the T, it, it would be great, but it's not uh, hinged on. Do you know what I mean? Uh, anybody want to volunteer and come diving? That's the next question. <laughs> I am a dive instructor, I can train you up. Three days, you give me three days. Um, yeah. So I hope, you know, I've built a kind of a picture that uh, historically dark, the dark and gloomy period, archaeologically, are we going to see something else, you know? Uh, I know Jakob's going to look at the material culture a lot more than I am. I'm much more interested in the, in the uh, if we go back here to the, the sites, uh, like the large scale of it. You know, how, how extensive, how big is this thing? You know, is it like McDonald's franchise or is it something more kind of... Uh, personal to the merchants themselves, how much they put into it themselves. I get the impression from the historic records that some were good, some were bad, some were total douchebags. Um, but not all of them, you know, like uh, this Trellum character uh, with the ship in flat, uh, he's well regarded here. And the funny thing is that uh, in the 16th century, um, a number of Icelanders put their names forward to be merchants, but uh, their own countrymen were writing to the king, do not give this guy a license. We don't want him. We want, uh, you know, someone from abroad. So, so it, there's more to it than just the Danes versus the the Icelanders. <coughs> I mean, it's it's something uh, more complicated. Even though historic, like compared to the Viking Age, there's a lot more historical records and archives 
for the period. It's still poorly understood, I think, the dynamics of it on the ground. Yeah. Final question? 